Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining me in our diagnostic training session today. I hope my audio is good because I'll tell you, on my side, it, it's not sounding so great. So hopefully you can let me know if the audio sounds okay. But uh, if you have any questions throughout this presentation, just make sure if you're watching us on Zoom, just look for the Q&A button at the top or the bottom of the screen. Click on that and you can type in your question, hit submit, and I'll get to those at the end of the session. If you're watching us live on YouTube, please feel free to use the live chat function in there. Uh, and just type in your question and I will get to those as soon as we're done with the presentation as well. Uh, so my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. A uh, little historic week, I guess, for me this week, because this is my 10-year anniversary with Snap-on, was Monday, uh, May 31st. Yeah, so yesterday was my 10-year anniversary with Snap-on. So pretty cool. The last eight years of that, I've been in the training department, traveling around North America, helping techs and shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. And before that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep. So that's how I came into Snap-on. I had 30 different Snap-on franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Then before that, eight years at Subaru. So I was a, a Subaru technician, I guess, over time became a Subaru diagnostic technician, right? So I always ended up getting those drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on the cars. Those would always seem to end up in my bay. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth was trying to figure out all these weird head scratcher type problems that would come into my bay. And before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching problems, been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. And tonight we are starting, this is uh, the first of soon to be many, I'm sure, uh, component testing specific uh, classes, right? So we're going to be focusing on a specific component every every class when, when we do this. So uh, it's going to be component testing fuel pump is today. So we're going to talk about different types of fuel pumps out there because we use the same electric fuel pump for years and years and years, and now we've started using some different styles. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, all of those as we go through it. So if we think about testing a component, uh, especially when it comes to like, say, a fuel pump, fuel injector, something like that. We can test it in a few different ways. We can test it electrically, right? We can check the voltage. We can check the ground, make sure the circuit's working, right? So circuit integrity. And then verifying the component itself is operating as well. So if we look at the signature of how it looks, um, you know, that, that's how we would test it electrically with, say, voltage. Then we can also check it mechanically by viewing the current flowing through the part, through the component. Uh, so they call that a current ramp test, right? It's going to verify our mechanical motion through there. And we'll see a couple different examples of that as we go through the uh, class today. And then hydraulically, right? If, if it's something that has something to do with a pressure, like a fuel pump, uh, we can view the pressure change, the pressure drop, uh, the deadhead pressure, if you will, if we want to check and, and make sure that it is producing proper pressure, we can verify the state of flow that way as well. So we're going to talk through a few different scenarios here. So first off, we'll start with our conventional electric fuel pump, right? We will skip over the mechanical fuel pumps from the 70s and 80s. That will come back in a little bit, but uh, we're going to start with our conventional electric fuel pumps. Uh, now, this is a basic diagram of a typical brushed motor, which is what they use, brushed DC motor inside an uh, electric fuel pump, one of the standard electric fuel pumps that you'd have in a tank. All right, so it has uh, these things called brushes, and the brushes are what ride on what we call the commutator segment. So the terminals will be attached to power and ground. So let's say we have power here, and we have ground there, just for explanation. Power will come in, and then it will uh, go on to one of these commutator segments, right? In this case, we have three segments. This is the best diagram I could come up with for this. So we have three segments. Most automotive fuel pumps that you're going to find are going to have eight segments in there and we'll use that to do a little bit of math a little later uh, but we see on this motor we have three and each of the coil sets so we have these coils here they call this the rotor this is the part that spins and then we have these uh, coils windings wrapped around it these are electromagnets and then on the outside we have what we call the stator that's the part that stays stationary that's how we can remember that uh, so rotor rotates stator stays still and uh, we have a north and a south on our magnets, right? So they're, they're permanent magnets in the case. When we apply electricity to these coils, it generates a magnetic field, and then that will allow this to spin, right? So uh, by repelling off one of these magnets, depending on which way it's going, it will spin 
based on that. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, this commutator is connected to that brush and this one's over here. So this coil in this scenario will be receiving voltage. So it'll come through here, go through there and come out there. This coil is also receiving voltage, but it's not completing the circuit because we have nothing touching this commutator segment here. Same with this coil. It's receiving, uh, it's got voltage there, but nothing's coming through on the other end either. So as this spins, you'll have that up and down of the flow of the voltage of the flow of the current going through here as it's repelling from the other magnets, right? So the, the, the north, north and south, they, they repel, right? So uh, we have them, that, and that's the principle it works on, right? So this, this brushed motor, voltage goes in one side, comes out the other side when it's making contact with those. Um, so this is a little bit better view of more like what it would be inside a fuel pump, electric fuel pumps. We have more coils and more commutator segments. Like I said, standard fuel pumps, eight commutator segments. Due to that, we have wear items, right? The brushes will wear out. The commutators will wear out over time. Um, I think it's probably fewer and further between that we have actual coil issues. It's more of issues in the, the brushes and the commutators of parts that move and they're designed to wear out over time. So they will wear out. Uh, the magnets stay stationary in this design, as we said, and then the brushes provide the voltage and the coils spin. That's how we can get coils of wire spin and not making a massive mess of copper inside there. It wouldn't get very far if we didn't have this system with the commutator and the brushes. If we wanted to look at an actual fuel pump diagram, uh, so we have the strainer here on the bottom. We have the fuel pump assembly. There's my electric motor right there in the middle. Got a bearing at the top. Got a pump in here. So uh, oftentimes it's gear driven pump or a, a, a vein type pump and the electric motor is used to spin the pump. It'll bring fuel in through the strainer and then out through the body and then out through the top right there in the outlet port. Now, most of the time also we'll find an anti-drain back valve. So that's the, that way the system doesn't drain all the fuel out as we go uh, once the pump shuts off. So here's the brushes at the top. There's my commutator segments right there. And then there's my armature with all my windings. And then I have my magnets on either side there. And, th and that's how it works. So we have an electric motor inside attached to a pump on the end. And there's also a pressure relief valve here. So if the pressure does get too high, it just bleeds back into the tank. All right, so knowing how it works and knowing how it's set up will help us when it comes to diagnosing it, right? So if we have a problem, we suspect we have a problem with the fuel pump. In this case, it's pretty easy to test because it's only two wires. We got power and we got ground. So it's fairly easy to test, uh, but there is a cool test that we can do with this that tells us a lot about how it's working. It's called the current ramp test. Now. Uh, if you have a snap-on tool with the guided component test in it, uh, we have vehicle-specific tests for pretty much any fuel pump out there for this current ramp test on it on a regular standard brushed fuel pump. So if you look up the vehicle, under guided component test is going to be in there. And it's fairly simple to do, though. Even if you don't have guided component testing and you still have a scope, you can still do this with a low amps probe and a scope. Uh, so it, ju it just does a lot of the work for you, right? So we want to try and get it, if we can, close to the pump. You know, some pumps that are right underneath the seat, you can pop the seat open and there's an access panel. You can clip around a wire there. Or if you can't access or if it's easier, we can go to a few, fuse box, pull the fuse out, put a jumper in, put it around there. Or same thing with a relay. We got the fuel pump relay, pull that out, put a jumper in there, put it around the feed wire that goes back to the uh, pump in that way. And what we're going to be looking at is, once again, the brushes and the commutators as they're spinning around in the motor. The amperage will change as it wears and the picture, what we'll be seeing on the screen will change based on how worn it is. All right, so here's just an example of, uh, this would be brushes on the end of the commutator. So we'd have brush there and a brush there probably and as it spins, it'll wear down over time, right? There's made of carbon and they will wear down over time. So that can cause some drivability issues. Here's an example fuel pump waveform that we might see. And once again, each of those bumps is one of those commutator segments going by the brushes. So we can see how it goes up and down, up and down. And we can see the amperage that it draws. It draws about, in this case, it was at an idle, wasn't heavy load on it. It's about amp and a half, two amps. Sometimes you'll see it higher, five amps, six amps, depends on the pump. Uh, so we see it going through here and we see these bumps. Each, Like I said, each one of those bumps is one of those commutator segments going by in the motor. 
Uh, you want to make sure the bumps are fairly rounded and there aren't any missing. Uh, so in this case, they're fairly round, right? The, they will get more round the more worn it gets. It's also starting to get a little bit of a shark fin look to it. So it was starting to wear out a little bit. I know this is a, a little while ago on my car and it looks a little different now, but uh, we do get a little bit of a shark fin there. Now let's imagine for a second that there was one missing. All right, so let's say, let's pick this one right here. Let's just say it's a flat spot, gone. I got bump, a bump, no bump, and then a bump, 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 right? If we have one flat spot, one missing spot, that indicates a bad commutator segment on that pump. Now that will cause an intermittent no start. Those are the kind of no starts also that you fix with the hammer, right? You tap on the bottom of the fuel tank and miraculously it starts up. Well, why is that? Well, if we have one bad commutator segment in there, or maybe even a pair, uh, it'll spin, right? And if we have eight, it stops on a good one. Then it spins up when it starts, and then it stops on a good one. And then it spins up, and then it stops on a bad one. But when it stops on a bad one, you got like one in eight chance of stopping on a bad one if you got one bad one. Then no current can flow through, no voltage can flow through, so it won't start its spin because it can't make that contact. Now, if I tap on the bottom of the fuel tank, like we've, we've seen before, it'll vibrate the pump. The pump moves, it turns and sets itself on a good commutator. Then it's able to get voltage and it fires up. So those are the ones where you tap or the one that came in on the hook on the back of the vibrating truck, right? And the tow truck brings it in and it vibrates. And those, those are the ones that start right off the back of the truck, right? I'm sure we've seen those before as well. So you want to make sure there aren't any missing. If you suspect that's a problem, it's a real easy test to do, and I don't have to drop the tank. I don't have to drain any fuel. I don't have to do any of that. So real easy to do. So that's one problem we could have, a no start. Another problem we could have is a volume problem. I could have a drivability problem and still have good fuel pressure, but have poor fuel volume, right? So, so drivability problem, let's say, for example, you're putt-putting around town working out okay and then when you really hammer down you really put a load on that engine and it has a demand for a lot of fuel and that just falls on its face that's a fuel delivery problem it can't get the fuel fast enough to the front of the engine right everything else could test fine you could even have perfectly fine fuel pressure at an idle right because fuel pressure is controlled by the regulator volume is controlled by the speed of the pump right so we want to make sure we can tell how fast the pump is turning as well so as we said, this is uh, eight bumps out. So that's one time around in the motor because we know most fuel pumps have eight uh, commutator segments. Some of the newer ones have 10. And then when you get to the brushless fuel pump, as you'll see, it's totally nothing like this. So we can't use that rule of thumb. But in this example, we know there's eight. So we'll just count out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then it repeats again. So if I contain one revolution within my cursors, I can see how long one revolution takes. So in this case, you know, rule of thumb is if you put it in a 10 millisecond window and it turns one time, that's 6,000 RPM because of math. Uh, so if you uh, use a guided component test, automatically puts it in 10 milliseconds. So you don't have to worry about that. But on this case, in this pump, it's one and a half times around. So I get one revolution here and then I get another pretty close to four bumps over there. So that's about one and a half times. So if one time in a 10 millisecond window, 6,000, and then half of 6,000 is 3,000, add those two together, this thing should be turning round about 9,000 RPM, screaming right along. All right, so let's do the math to prove it out. If we take those cursor measurements, a little, little bit of math. Now the cursors were set up once again to contain one revolution of the motor, so that in that case, we get 6.95 milliseconds. That's how that measured up. So one revolution of the pump takes 6.95 milliseconds. There are 60,000 milliseconds in a minute. So we take 60,000 and divide by how long one revolution takes, which is 6.95 milliseconds. We get the RPM of the pumps, the revolutions per minute. How many times is that 6.95 going to 60,000? So it get, tur turns out to be 8,633. That is very close to the 9,000 we eyeballed on the other screen. That's within 5%. That's close enough. Now, when you get a fuel pump that's running good, it's going to be five to 6,000 RPM or more, depending on what you see in this example, 8,600. And this was at an idle too. So uh, five to 6,000 RPM or more. When you get down to 3,000 RPM or less, that's where you're going to start to have that fuel delivery problem, that volume problem, right? We have one car 
I remember years ago we checked and it was uh, it was that situation where I was telling you it's fine putt putting around town, hammered down, put a good load on it, falls on its face. They were checking mass airflow. They were checking all sorts of different things. Ended up being the fuel pump was turning at like 1400 RPM. So it was barely able to provide enough fuel to the front of that car. So definitely worth looking at. And it's like I said, it's really easy to do to current ramp that. So uh, pretty cool. So let's talk about now control methods, because if we know how it's controlled, that's going to differentiate how we're going to test it, right? So the first way is our basic relay control, right? It's got power, it's got power and ground. It's our basic fuel pump that they've been using since, you know, electric fuel pumps have started bit, been, being common. So I have a relay, usually in my relay box. I'll have power come from a fuse. I'll have the computer control, usually the ground side on the coil on the uh, inside the relay. So we power up the coil, pulls over the switch, turns on the relay, and then it should provide 12 volt power to the motor. Motor continuously runs. The pump's gonna run continuously as long as I have power and ground. If I check at the pump and I don't have power, better check that relay, better check uh, anything in the wiring. Looks like I got a connector in there as well. Also wanna double check the ground to make sure that's good, right? So it's fairly simple to test though power, ground, and then I could do that current ramp test where I put it around one wire in the circuit and see how it's moving, All right? Next one's kind of the next step of that, All right? So some vehicles will have a controller that controls the speed of the pump, All right? So we do have some variable speed fuel pumps out there. And uh, in this case, we still have a relay. Relay provides the power to the mo control module. It's not really a control module so to speak there's not a lot of not a lot of chips and stuff in there not a lot of logic to it uh but it is it, it does vary the pulse depending on what the computer says all right so it gets power in and then we have ground and then we have some uh signals from the computer and then we have the two wires that go over to the pump so it varies the pulse going to the pump to speed it up or slow it down all right so that's that's what allows it to uh to, to spin in that way all right so that is uh, that's another way and then we have the newest kit on the block, our brushless controller, which as I said, totally, totally different than anything we're used to out there. Uh, so that has an actual computer that controls it. It's got battery power and it's got a signal from the computer for fuel pump control. On this vehicle, it's only just a 12 volt pulse. Uh, so it's not, it's just a square wave is all we would see, just serial data, not even serial data, it's just a 12 volt pulse really. And then we have a ground for the module. Then on the left-hand side, we have, this is the um, harness that goes to the pump. This is on a Toyota Camry, and they call that a fuel suction tube assembly with pump and gauge. It's fuel pump. And we see we have fuel pump V, U, and W, and then G. So the V, the U, and the W, there's three phases to how this motor works. And then the G is gonna be the ground. So the ground goes into the, into the pump itself, and then it also has a shield that's attached to it as well. So really you get these three power phases and uh, that's what controls it. Okay, it's kind of wild. <laughs> when I went and, went and did this, like, boy, that's totally different than the brushed fuel pumps we're used to for sure. Uh, so brushless fuel pumps, newer vehicles are starting to use this. Now I searched high and low, far and wide, trying to find a comprehensive list of vehicles that use it. And I haven't been able to find it. If somebody can find it, that would be awesome if you could send me the link on that. But I've never been able to find a list of, here's all the vehicles that use brushless fuel pumps. Uh, I know Volkswagen and Audi have been using them on some models, not every model since 2011. And uh, this is on uh, Toyota. So 2016, 2017, 2018, Toyota started using them on some models, not all. That's, that's the key there. Uh, so it works in a it's, it's a very similar principle. This is the same principle, really. It's just electromagnetism. But uh, it's backwards from what we were seeing on those brushed fuel pumps. So instead of the coils turning and the magnets being stationary, the coils are stationary and the magnets turn. All right, so we have a lot on the outside. You'll see we have these pairs of coils that are uh, 180 degrees apart from each other. Or, or, yeah, 180 degrees apart from each other. And then we have uh, three pairs. And they're 120 degrees apart in the rotation. So 360 degrees for a circle, 120 degrees apart on these coils of magnets. And you see we got a south pole and a north pole. And depending on how these coils are energized, 
it's going to go one time it's going to go north south and then when it went when that rotor makes it through it's going to go the other way and then it'll be south north right so it flips the polarity of these coils as it spins around because we can run electricity in two different directions right so it, it does a positive and then it does a negative uh, so it's kind of cool how it works so it makes it very very efficient and also makes it so I don't have those wear items of the brushes and the commutators. We don't have to worry about it wearing out. All right, so as we see, this is a very slow animation, but if you pay attention to just one pair of these, these uh, coils, you see that's on a, on a north alignment. Now they're black, so they're off. Now it's on a south alignment. And you'll see the south lines up with the south, and then once it passes, it turns off. And then this one goes to the south. And then this one will turn south here in a second, right? Because we got the south and then it pushes, right? So it's a little bit on the back end. So it's got to push it from the back. That's turning very, very slow for a motor, but it gives you the uh, gives you the interpretation of what's happening. So it turns on a pair of coils, either in a positive or a negative polarity, depending on uh, where the permanent magnets are in relation to the coils. All right, so the coils are stationary on the outside, the magnets spin on the inside, and that's what spins the shaft. No wear items in that case. All right, so here it is on the 2018 Toyota Camry 2.5. Once again, we just looked at this. So we got the V, the U, and, and, and the W in the ground, and then battery and control and ground over there as well. And this is what we captured off of. Now I'm going to go into more detail here in a minute when we go live, but that's, that's what it looks like. <laughs> it's totally different, totally different than what we're used to on brush fuel pumps. So we'll take a deeper dive in this when we go live. So I got the recording on my tool. Uh, so we'll just pull that up and we can, we'll be able to take a better look at it. Also on this vehicle, this is a Toyota system. I believe it's what's so D4S is what they call it. And that is a high pressure and a low pressure system on the same engine. So it is high pressure direct injection. And then it also has a regular low pressure standard gasoline fuel injectors on there. So in order to get my high pressure for my direct injectors, I need to use a high pressure fuel pump. So on this, in this case, I know there's a bunch of different types of high pressure fuel pumps and we could probably you know, do uh, talk a little bit more about them if we ever get around to direct injection, which I'm sure we will, but um, it's a mechanically driven pump off the camshaft. And it was funny, I was talking to Al today about this and he's like, boy, it's just like, just like back in the 60s, 70s, whatever, we had the little mechanical fuel pump running off the camshaft yeah it's, it's the same principle it's just a lot higher pressure involved and really the only electrical connector on this style of pump is just for a, a like say bleed off valve all right so all it does is yeah it runs off a lobe on the end of the camshaft looks like a rounded square in this case uh so it just pushes up on the pump uh piston and it's able to compress our fuel here's a cross section and uh, like I said, I know there's a few different makes, models, variations out there, but this is the one that's on this vehicle that we're looking at. So the plunger goes up and it compresses it four times every time the uh, camshaft turns. And then the spill valve opens and closes depending on pressure. So if we need less pressure, we just spill off, bleed off some of it. If we don't need the, if we do need more pressure, then it closes it off and it raises the pressure on that. So not a lot to test on that. Also, you need to be very aware that there are high pressures on there in that a thousands of PSI. You ever seen a, 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 like one of those water cutter things? It's thousands of PSI water pressure and it's able to cut through steel. Yeah, this could do the same thing. It could also cut through you. So you want to be very, very careful when it comes to working around high pressure systems. Um, really, the only thing you can test on here is, as I said, that spill valve. And it is just an ohms reading on that. All right, so let's switch over to the tool and talk a bit about some more stuff here. Let's see. All right, so first off, I'm going to pull my vehicle out of my history. So I got this 2018 Camry here. Now let's go into guided component tests real quick. So I just want to look at a couple different things uh, that you might be able to find in there. So let's see, fuel system. Now guided component test, for those of you who, who are uninitiated in the guided component test, is uh, on any snap-on scan tool with a scope, it has a guided component test. Guided component test is a database of millions of tests. There's over 5 million tests in there. It goes all the way back to 1981. 
covers multiple systems on a vehicle. And then once we load into a system, we see the components we can test or subsystems as well. And we can see that right here. I have the fuel system up on the screen. Uh, now, like I said, it has direct injectors. So we have tests for that. Uh, main relay is important for the fuel injection. This is the non-direct fuel injectors because it has both. Fuel pressure test, fuel pressure sensor, uh, fuel pump control module, right? That's gonna tell us a little bit about how that works. So we have the UV and the W, right? And then the ground. Uh, it's gonna be sent to the ECU, which is power and ground at a low pressure pump as needed. And then that spill control valve, right? So that spill control valve is on top of the high pressure fuel pump. So it gives us all sorts of information on that. Also tells us what the connector looks like. And then there's a resistance test for that. And then also a uh, system operation is gonna tell us a lot about how it works, right? So pressure regulators in there. Engine uses a D4S direct fuel injection system and allows for direct injection of fuel in the cylinder along with port injection. So it's a direct injection directly into the cylinder and then it also has our standard uh, regular uh, fuel, fuel injectors which spray the back of the valves and the intake manifold allows us to keep the valves clean too. Uh, so that's how that works. Uh, the low pressure side goes from 28 to 121 PSI. Then the high pressure side is a range of about 290 to 2900 PSI. Idle pressure is about 350 PSI with that high pressure fuel pump we were talking about, right? So wealth of information in there. If you wanna just look up a car, you can look up all that information. The beauty of it is you don't have to be hooked up to a car to do it uh, in order to do that. So wealth of information in there. Let's go into my, oops. Yeah, I, wanted, I do wanna go in there. And go in here and let's pull up a few of these patterns that we took, right? So we have our Camry at an idle. This is a recording, scope recording. Now I went in a little close, so I wanted to be able to capture as much as I could. And then we'll just move, let's look somewhere in the middle here. And I'll just zoom in a little bit. There we go. All right, so that is, we see the three phases, 120 degrees off. All right, so we have that, that, that. So we have a positive and a negative as well, though. So if we see here, this is a positive. And I know that because, oh, let me just uh, back up here for a second. So we have uh, one here, which is the... Uh, U, V, W, right? So this is pin one, pin two, pin three. Had the three pins, I was at the control module itself, back probing voltage. And then this here on the bottom is the amperage coming off of channel one, because you can only do one channel at a time with that. So uh, off of channel one, here's the amperage. Let me move it over a smidgen, okay. So we can see we have flat amperage. Now, the other thing about this amperage, if you remember looking at the current ramp on the brushed fuel pump, it was all positive or all negative, depending on, on which way it had flipped over. But this is all positive and negative. This is like an AC type component to this waveform. It goes positive, it goes negative. So I have it set around zero. There's nothing. Then you'll see when it kicks on. Let me turn on my cursors too. That'll help. So you see when it kicks on right there. That's where it kicks on and that's where my amperage starts. You'll also notice that once this one kicks off, here we can see our kicks off right there, the amperage increases because now we don't have two running at the same time. Well, we don't have th all three running at the same time. We only have two running at the same time there, right? So we have th this one and this one. So the amperage kicks off. And then again, when this one kicks on and this one kicks off, we get a little bit of a kick in the amperage and then it drops down. And then when this channel one kicks off totally, since we're amp clamp is on that channel, it's flat. Then when it kicks on again, you'll see it goes negative. So remember how I said we had to have different way to swap polarities depending on where the magnets are in the rotation. So I have a positive and a negative. If we actually go in a little bit closer here. Let me go in a little bit like right in here. Let's go closer there. You'll see that I have so I get two, no, maybe not. So this one goes down the square wave at the end. These are just pulse width modulated controls, by the way. Uh, so you see it goes down on this end. That's our positive. And then our negative actually goes up on the end. Okay, so we can see how they switch and then they alternate too. So this one's, uh, the pulse is going down. This one, the pulse is going up. This one, the pulse is going down. And then on this one, the pulse will go up, pulse will go down, pulse will go up. All right, so they're flip-flopping, they're switching 
their polarity back and forth, as we said. So really what you wanna see is you wanna make sure that electrically you're getting signals because this is all just from the control module, right? This isn't telling us uh, really how the pump itself is working. The proof that the pump is working though is down here on the bottom, right? The amp clamp is telling us we have amperage flowing through the circuit and it's working. It will vary top to bottom. This is at an idle. If you go up in speed, the frequency gets shorter because it speeds up the pump. Now, if I wanted to check pump RPM, I can do so as well. What I need to do is contain one revolution in between my two cursors, right? Now, is one revolution this? No. Because remember, we have the half and half. So we have the one polarity and the other polarity. So I have to go through both polarities. So I need to start, say, this is the beginning. Then we get halfway through. This is, the, this is the other polarity. And then we have back to the beginning again over here. We can see that on the current ramp. So we get a positive and then we get a negative. And then when it goes back to positive, that's where I'll, I'll, I'll make my cutoff. So that is one full revolution of that motor. In that case, let me pull up my measurements here. 10.95 milliseconds at a night. In that case, pull up my calculator here. 60,000 divided by 10.95. 5,400 RPM, 5,479 RPM at an idle, not bad, right? So it, it falls in line with the brush fuel pump as far as speed, right? But as you can see how it works, totally different, totally different how it works, uh, totally different construction. Yeah, you know, it's just, it, it was it was really wild because I had been trying to find one of these forever, trying, because it, like, it's again, I couldn't find a list of vehicles in order to check. So I, I found like one random video on YouTube and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. I got to find one so I can test this. Uh, so I thought that was kind of kind of neat, little useful information here. Uh, so these are just pulse width modulated now. So this is an idle. Let me show you another one I captured. You can also do a functional test on this pump with the scan tool and we can run it at 17% uh, duty and a 35% duty is what, it, what the options it gives you. So this is at 17% duty, that is at idle, right? So it does a 17% duty. If we increase it to 35%, it does this. Remember how it looked before, where it was kind of spread out. So now I have flat goes up, flat goes down, flat goes up. There's one revolution of the pump right there at a faster duty cycle. So let's see where that leads us. 5.05 milliseconds. Eleven thousand RPM. Things screaming right along, and then you'll see the pattern. There is a pattern there, but it's interesting how the pulse widths uh, line up there. So it's got some really interesting stuff going on with the pattern. But you do see it does kind of give us a repetitive pattern. I got my up. I have this big one, this big one, these little ones. And then my down, I have a big one, a big one, and some little ones in there too. So you can see how the pattern flip-flops back and forth. It looks kind of weird. At first glance, you might think it's a little bit of a garbage pattern too, but it, it's it's not. That's just how it controls the pulse on, on the motor there. So uh, we can see that's just kind of a little interesting aside. And then the last capture I have is of the PCM control. And this one's really boring. <laughs> it's just that. It's so a 12 volt pulse about every 12 milliseconds or so. So it's about, about every time it, it, it wants it to turn, it'll, it'll send the pulse and then it sends the, uh, the control out. So not a lot going on there, but you need to have a signal there. Otherwise it won't work, right? So if I don't have a signal going to the controller, the controller won't turn on the fuel pump. All right, Whew. that is a lot to cover in kind of a short amount of time, right? We've got to try and keep these in that 30, 30 to 35 minute range, right? So a lot going on there, a lot of differences with those fuel pumps. Hope you learned a little bit. I know I did making this class for sure. I definitely learned a lot about how those brushless fuel pump work because they're really, I couldn't find a ton of information out there. So hopefully we've uh, given you a few little nuggets. Next week, we continue our component testing class and we move to oxygen sensors. So we're gonna talk about both zirconia oxygen sensors, the old school uh, zirconia sensors, as well as the uh, wideband AF sensors that they're using on, well, most vehicles nowadays. 
Uh, so if you want to join me for that, Oxygen Sensors, that's next week live, uh, 6 and 9 p.m. as always, Eastern Time. Go to snapon.com slash OT if you want to join on Zoom. Also, we stream the first class on live to YouTube, so we're doing that right now. You go to youtube.com slash snapon diagnostics and uh, definitely hit that subscribe button. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe as well. And then definitely give it a thumbs up and hit that little bell next to the subscribe button too so you get a notification next time that we're streaming. Also, the late session goes on to my Facebook page. So if you want to search out Jason can bring the snap on trainer, uh, that's my Facebook page. And I stream live to that on the late session as well. It's trying to give you as many opportunities as possible to catch it live so you can ask your questions and uh, any any questions that you have. Once again, so I uh, see quite a quite a bit of activity on uh, on YouTube right now. So I'll get to that. And then on uh, Zoom, if you have any questions, make sure you put them in that Q&A box as well. Also on YouTube, we do, re as I said, we stream these live. When we're done with it, we save it. So we have a list of all the classes that we have previously recorded. So this will be episode 18 we're doing right now on our fuel pumps. Uh, so you can see ADOS, data bus testing, diagnostic workflows, thermal imager, you know, all sorts of information available there. Uh, so definitely go check that out as well. YouTube.com slash snap on diagnostics. There's a playlist for live training. And with that, let's get to questions. While I'm looking at questions, let's talk about my buddy Al as well. Uh, you may have seen, if you have a snap on scan tool in the last week or two, you may have seen a little pop-up come up and say, hey, check out our free online training that Al does. So Al does training platform specific. So specific to a scan tool. Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Uh, so Apollo's on Monday, Zeus is on Wednesday, and Triton is on Thursday. Uh, we go through, he goes everything from, let's set up your Wi-Fi. A lot of people don't have their Wi-Fi set up. All the way through, let's set up your free Snap-on Cloud account so we can share uh, with our customers and things of that nature. Uh, all the way through uh, soup to nuts, code to completion on intelligent diagnostics. How does it help us save diagnostic time? Uh, how does it help us with, you know, our day-to-day -day, uh, diagnostic lives there by filtering out all the stuff we don't need and just giving us what we do. With. So he walks you through all that. Al is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to Snap-on Diagnostics. He's been here since it started, Snap-on Diagnostics. So came over with the brick. So definitely he has a long history of Snap-on, a wealth of information, definitely worth your time if you haven't checked it out or if you got a buddy who just, just got a tool and wants to learn a little bit more about it, that's definitely a good way to go. So let's see, looking at Zoom, I don't see any questions in there. Uh, let's look at YouTube. I got my screen way up there. Hi from Alaska, Rick. Great. Let's see, uh, Vera said, Windows 10. Um, that is not a supported configuration that we provide. And I guess I can leave it at that. It is a Windows unit, and yes, it runs the same hardware as Zeus, but we won't do it for you. Okay. <laughs> All right, and we got a couple of sound checks up there earlier. Yep. Uh, hi, JC Mobile Diagnostics. Welcome, welcome. Hello from Morocco. Thank you. Hello from Sweden. Awesome. Hello from Mexico. Great. So we're this is really a global class. I love this. Uh, being able to get out there and, and speak to all of you. It's pretty awesome. Uh, Steven, thank you very much. Dan, thank you. Very good info. Uh, Spiro, Brian, Robert, thank you very much for your comments as well. So with that, not seeing much else coming through on questions. Hopefully we covered it. Oop, we got one pop up on Zoom here. Oh, hello from Canada, Gino. Yeah, we, we're truly a global audience tonight. This is great. This is great. I love being able to do this and getting out there for everybody, and hopefully increasing our diagnostic knowledge as we go. Because, you know, nobody knows everything. I know I don't. That's for sure. Uh, so we definitely learn a lot. I definitely learn a lot putting some of these classes together too. So uh, it's pretty cool that we're able to do that. So with that, looks like we're good. Looks like we got all our questions covered. Uh, hopefully uh, can, you can join us next week for oxygen sensors. And we can keep on going down our component testing path. Uh, so with that, thank you very much for taking time out of your day, your week. Uh, just come hang out and uh, learn a little bit more about diagnosing cars. Um, definitely appreciate it. Wouldn't be able to do it if you all didn't come and hang out with us. So hopefully we got some, a uh, little bit more knowledge on how fuel pumps work, how we can test them. Uh, Cause once again, the more you, the better you know how they work, the easier it might be to test it, right? So hopefully we got through that. 
Uh, enjoy the rest of your week for sure. Uh, stay safe out there and take care.